Former President de Klerk, Professors Maron Sela and Fenter, friends and colleagues, it is an honor to speak to you today. Jacques has asked me to talk about the role of the judiciary in protecting our constitutional order. I'm going to use this as a framework to discuss three topics. The first is the pandemic and the lockdown regulations that have followed and its infringement on our rights. The second is the threat of expropriation without compensation. The third is the re-racialization of South Africa and our failure to embrace the value of, of non-racialism in section one of our constitution. The pandemic has posed an enormous challenge to countries all around the world. Governments have resorted to very strict lockdown measures in an effort to save citizens and to protect the healthcare system. All of you will remember President Ramaphosa's address in March last year, claiming that government would need a three week lockdown in order to prepare the healthcare system in order to save lives. Well, it's been over 300 days. Many lives have been lost and many businesses have been shuttered. The question is, has there been overreach in some of the regulations that have been put forward? Well, undoubtedly, many of them were entirely arbitrary, capricious, and served only to enhance the power of the state to the detriment of citizens. We look back on some of the more obscene regulations, this is quite evident. First of all, you'll remember that there was a ban on business, except for essential services. And the idea was that this was a way of reducing contact between citizens. Now, of course, one of the things that would be very useful to keep businesses alive would be allowing people to trade online. But government found it fit to ban this too. So all stores that were trading online that weren't selling essential services were forbidden from engaging in commerce. Thankfully, civil society pushed back against this and the ban was dropped. There was also a ban on exercise. People were only allowed to leave their homes for three hours and the types of exercise they were allowed to do was restricted to walking, cycling, and jogging. So if you wanted to surf or do yoga, you couldn't do it outside. Through civil society action, government retreated on this front. One of the more horrifying government measures was the idea that anyone who tested positive for COVID could be forcibly quarantined by the state. Now, a case was run in, in which people were quarantined under horrendous conditions and that quarantine center was shut down. And through further litigation efforts, government withdrew the regulation which would have allowed it to quarantine people against their will. The impact on fundamental rights and liberties has been extreme. There have been restrictions on where people were allowed to work, travel, pray, and educate their children. Now, some of these measures may have had a rational connection to the notion of protecting lives and insisting the healthcare system, but many of them have been, have been an overreach. The original approach from our courts was to see if one could draw a straight line between the measure taken and the purpose of the measure. The initial approach taken by our courts was extraordinarily deferential. The idea was to trust government no matter how extreme the measures were. One of the first cases that was brought to challenge the regulations was by a, a group of religious Muslims who argued that they had a fundamental religious right to worship together. The courts found that this right could be overridden on the basis that government claimed that there was a rational connection between limiting public gatherings and protecting lives. The problem with the low bar threshold of rationality is that all it requires is for a story to be told between restricting a right or severely limiting it and being able to achieve this noble purpose of saving lives. And so government relied on this method to restrict a series of our ordinary rights and liberties. One of the most notorious measures taken by government was the ban on cigarettes. The claim was that smokers were more likely to wind up in hospital if they contracted COVID and therefore it was rational to ban cigarettes to provide more access to hospital beds for other citizens. Now the problem with this claim is that while it may be the case that lifelong smokers are more likely to wind up in a hospital bed if they get COVID, it's not clear at all that a multi-month long restriction on cigarettes would have any effect. It really is the lifelong use of smoking as opposed to a temporary cessation of smoking that makes the difference. Now in the British and American tobacco case, the courts considered the question and ultimately said that what must be done is to engage in a balancing exercise. That it's not, it's not enough to make the claim that there's a rational connection between the, the goal that you have, which may be a noble goal, and, and the measure that is taken. The rights themselves must be protected. And so the courts relied on Section 36 of our Constitution. Section 36 is the limitations clause. It says that any right in the Bill of Rights can be limited by a law of general application provided that it is reasonable and justifiable to do so in an open and democratic country and that the limitations are themselves proportional. So one must consider the importance of the nature of the right, the importance of the purpose of the limitation, whether there is in fact actually a rational connection between these things, and of course, whether alternative measures could be taken that are less restrictive of the right. Now, a number of rights were at play in this case, the right to dignity, the right for people to make choices about their own body, the right to, to freedom of trade so that those that are in the cigarette business um, could continue to operate and the right to privacy that people should be free to do what they want in their own homes without government restrictions.
Now, the economic consequences were, of course, quite severe for those in the, in the cigarettes industry. Many farmers had to shut their operations down, which would have had a knock-on effect for their laborers, who are among some of the most poor and vulnerable members of our society. The court ultimately found that the, that the ban was disproportionate and that government was not free to make any restriction that it wanted on our rights, um, merely because it had a noble purpose in mind. Now, I'm not a smoker, and I'm sure many of you in the room aren't either, but we must recognize that the importance of this case is really in providing a framework for evaluation. The pandemic looks like it's going to persist much longer than any of us would like, and government will continue to produce regulations which will intrude upon our basic liberties. What the case does is send a signal to government that it cannot do what it likes, and that civil society can make use of it to challenge any other regulations that are disproportionate and irrational. We must also remember that government could have declared a state of emergency instead of a state of disaster. Under a state of emergency, the state would have had the power to have derogated from many of the rights in the Bill of Rights. But there also would have been parliamentary oversight. You can't keep up a state of emergency indefinitely. What we found with a state of disaster is that the state has acted as if it can set aside all the rights in the, in the Bill of Rights without any parliamentary oversight indefinitely. And this state of affairs, of course, is rather troublesome. So there is more litigation on its way. Um, and there is a challenge to the Disaster Management Act on the grounds that it doesn't provide for parliamentary oversight. We must remember that there's something rather troubling about an executive being able to make decisions by decree and do so without any proper checks and balances. But while the legislature is not meeting its obligations, it's open to the courts to play that role of upholding our constitution. The threat of expropriation without compensation has been hanging over our heads like a sword of Damocles for a number of years now. Like government efforts to address the pandemic, the move to change our constitution to allow for expropriation without compensation purports to be done for good purposes. The claim is that the wrongs of the past can only be addressed by altering this fundamental right in our Bill of Rights. Now, don't get me wrong. I think it's important that we do remedy the wrongs of the past, but we also need to acknowledge what we've done to do so already. From 1995 to 2014, 1.8 million individuals received compensation either in the form of land or money as part of a land claims process. 95% of the claims that were instituted during this period of time have in fact been resolved. Another striking factor is that when given the choice, most individuals decided to choose the money as opposed to the land. Now there's a very good reason for this because money translates into freedom. Money provides people with choices. It lets them pay off their debts, start a new business, or acquire a piece of land in an area of their choosing. Government has also spread the idea that there is a burning hunger for land, that it's a top priority issue for many South Africans. However, the Institute for Race Relations survey on the topic finds that South Africans are much more concerned about crime and education than they are about land reform. Only a few percent of people were interested in the topic at all. Furthermore, we know that there are dramatic consequences to implementing a policy of expropriation without compensation. If we look at Venezuela and Zimbabwe, we see that stripping people of their property rights doesn't just harm those who own the property, it harms everyone. Both of those countries have had some of the world's worst cases of inflation, and people were driven into poverty and unemployment and despair. One of the mistakes being made is the notion that South Africa is an exceptional country. The terrible ideas that have been tried in other places will work here without consequence. This is, of course, erroneous. I think many of us will be in agreement that it's a disastrous policy. The question is, what can our courts do to protect us from it? Well, at the moment, the Constitution hasn't yet been changed, but there is a call to amend it. And what that call does is allow not only for land to be confiscated, but also for the improvements upon the land to be confiscated without any compensation. Now, this would include residential homes, businesses, farming infrastructure, crops, you name it. So it would be quite far reaching. So the question is, what can be done? Is there any challenge that could be brought? Well, to my mind, there are a couple of options. The first is procedural. There was a large public participation process when South Africans are asked to answer a very narrow question, which is, do you support expropriation of land without compensation? And, and many individuals and civil society organizations wrote in and expressed their disdain for the idea. In fact, two thirds of people thought that it would be a terrible idea. But the point is that they were asked a narrow question only relating to land, not to improvements thereon. And therefore the proposed change goes beyond this mandate. Another way of thinking about the problem is that there are certain kinds of amendments to the constitution that are not amendments at all, but that they fundamentally alter its basic structure. So the idea is that there are certain things that have to be in our constitution, and then once you take them out, we no longer have a constitution at all. So before our constitution was put in place, there were a series of, of constitutional principles which the constitution had to comply with. And in the certification judgments, the constitutional court initially struck down a version of, a, a version of the constitution 
on the basis that it did not comply. One of the arguments is that the right to property is a fundamental right, and that if a state confiscates your property, it is a part of natural justice that you receive compensation. And that if this right were removed, which of course would be out of accordance with international law, they would also be at odds with the basic structure of our constitution. There are two particular sections of the constitution that support this notion. The first is in section one, which states that South Africa is a nation founded upon the rule of law. And there is case law to imply that the rule of law encompasses fundamental human rights. And the second is a section which I've already mentioned, section 36 of the constitution, the limitations clause. And here the idea is that any law which would limit a right in the Bill of Rights must go through a justification process as set out in the section. In international law and in countries all around the world, the consequence of confiscating someone's property is that they'll pay compensation and it must be prompt and adequate. In South African law at the moment, the test is just and equitable. Now to remove the, the requirements of just and equitable would be a violation of the protections in section 36. It would not be the kind of limitation that could be put in place in an open and democratic country. So the argument would be that even if the constitution were changed through the requisite number of votes, either two thirds, because it would be a change to the Bill of Rights, or the heftier amount of 75%, because it would be a change to section one of our constitution by eroding the rule of law, that even then the numbers wouldn't be sufficient because there's something fundamental baked into our constitution for the economy, for international investment. Now there is very good reason for government not to persist in its quest to change the constitution. The pandemic and the subsequent lockdowns have wrought havoc on our economy. And now will be one of the worst times to change the most fundamental rights in our Bill of Rights. If we find ourselves in the precarious situation where government succeeds in changing the constitution, all is not lost. It'll be incumbent upon civil society to take the matter to court and to fight to protect property rights and our constitution. Of course, judges will have to play an important role in this matter. And some of the arguments that I've given to you today may be important tools in the judgments that they deliver to protect our constitution. I'd now like to turn to the topic of non-racialism. Non-racialism is entrenched in section one of our constitution and is described as a founding value, but it is often neglected by our courts and often neglected by our government. Now, if I think about the value of non-racialism, the quote that sums it up to my mind is that of Martin Luther King, where he says, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Now, what's interesting is that this notion of non-racialism permeates the Freedom Charter as well. The Charter states that South Africa belongs to all who lives in it, black and white. The rights of the people shall be the same, regardless of race. All laws which discriminate on the grounds of race, color, and belief shall be repealed, and the restriction of land ownership on a racial basis shall be ended. In 1991, the ANC produced a document entitled Constitutional Principles for a Democratic South Africa. This proclaimed that a non-racial South Africa means a South Africa in which all the artificial barriers and assumptions which kept people apart and maintain domination are removed. In its negative sense, non-racial means the elimination of all color bars. In positive terms, it means the affirmation of equal rights for all. It presupposes a South Africa in which every individual has an equal chance, irrespective of his birth or color. It recognizes the worth of each individual. The value of non-racialism was finally legally crystallized in the first section of our constitution. The Republic of South Africa is one sovereign democratic state founded on the value of non-racialism. And the Constitutional Court has said something about non-racialism too. The long-term goal of our society is a non-racial, non-sexist society in which each person shall be recognized and treated as a human being of equal worth and dignity. No members of a racial group should be made to feel that they do not deserve equal concern, respect, and consideration, and that the law is likely to be used against them more harshly than others belonging to other groups. And to achieve the magnificent breadth of our Constitution's promise of full equality and freedom from disadvantage, we must foresee a time when we can look beyond race. However, in the last few years, the value of non-racialism has come under attack. Race has become the lens through which all South Africa's woes are viewed. Redress programs have emphasized race over genuine disadvantage, which has led to the poor and vulnerable being sidelined, while the wealthy and connected are prioritized. The obsession with race has led to a range of perverse outcomes. I'll give you a couple of examples. So recently we've introduced the Legal Practice Council, which regulates the entire legal profession. And they had an election. Advocate Mayosi ran for elected office to represent all legal practitioners in the Western Cape. After receiving the fourth highest tally of votes in an election that provided for four seats for advocates, she was disallowed from taking up her position. The sole reason for her disqualification was that she had been classified by the Legal Practice Council as a black woman. If this election and classification by a state body had happened before 1994, it would be considered a horror of the past, but unsurprising. 
The fact that it happened in 2019 is an injustice beyond the pale. The election results were required to follow a rigid race quota, so that there was exactly one white male, one white female, one black male, and one black female among the advocates. Candidates in the election were not required to list their race, which means that the LPC engaged in a racial classification process of its own. It's unknown what methods were used to determine the race of the participants, since no current legislation determines how South Africans are to be classified by race. Did officials surmise their race by looking at images of candidates alongside a Pantone sheet of colors from light to dark? Was an assessment based on the person's name? These questions deserve answers, but it is apparent that participants were burdened and benefit on their race as determined by some unknown standard and by some unknown process. The Cape Bar brought a challenge to the legality of the election, but their application was dismissed. Another absurd example was that of Bayer's Chocolates, who employ over 400 people and most of their employers are black women. The Department of Labor threatened to take the company to the Labor Court because it believes only 36.2% of Gauteng residents are black women, which means that some of them should be removed to correct the overrepresentation in the business. With regards to land, government has put forward a policy to determine who will qualify as a beneficiary for farmland allocated by the state. The policy defines previously disadvantaged citizens in terms of race as opposed to neutral factors like economic means. The effect is to exclude millions of citizens from receiving benefits because of their race. And finally, one of the most egregious insults during the pandemic has been a race-based COVID relief scheme. Government created financial assistance programs for small and medium-sized businesses and for businesses in the tourism sector that will be negatively affected by COVID. One of the deciding factors for receiving relief would be the racial makeup of the businesses. Afri Forum and Solidarity challenged the race-based nature of the tourism fund and the DA brought a challenge to the SMME fund. In both cases, the court held that the use of racial preferencing was lawful. In the Solidarity case, the court explicitly jettisoned the value of non-racialism when it held that a race-neutral response can have the effect of deepening the fault lines in our society. In the DA case, the court held that competing visions of the meaning of the animating normative framework of the Bill of Rights may create a level of uncertainty, but what is not uncertain is that this constitution read as a whole cannot be construed as a libertarian constitution, as some would have it, or as a race-neutral constitution eliding over an egregious history in which race overlaid by class and gender were the central determinants of the distribution of resources in our society for more than 300 years of its existence. Both cases are under appeal, and it remains to be seen whether these decisions will be overturned. South Africans fought and died for the value of non-racialism to be entrenched in our constitution. Once we acknowledge that racial preference has been the source of many of our problems, we must realize that it cannot be part of our solutions.